So we are continuing a series we started last Sunday as we're studying on the book through the book of John, uh, through First John, not not the gospel, but the letter. And as we look at that, we see these these themes that run throughout the letter of light and love and life. And and last week as we jumped into to chapter one and uh, and the first little part of chapter two, we we, we saw mainly this 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 theme of light as it came out. But as we, as we study this letter, we realize that it is uh, of one of the books of the Bible that John, the Apostle John wrote. He wrote five books of the New Testament. The first one was his gospel, and we look at the, the first three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then as the Synoptic Gospels, then John wrote the last one, which is significantly different than the other gospels, just in style and just pace and just the way that it's written. And again, we see John's personality and, and, and his, um, you know, his, his, the way he writes and the different themes that he gives. It runs through all of the books that he wrote. It starts again with the Gospel of John. Then he wrote these three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he also wrote Revelation, the very last book of the New Testament. And, and we see his writing, his themes kind of, kind of run through all of them. And, and within all of the books, he uses the same tone and style he uses similar language and illustrations in all of the books that he wrote. And it's really interesting that we can kind of learn some about John in, the way, in even the way that he wrote. And, and the fact that he, he wrote most of his, the biblical books there, he wrote them anonymously. Right? He didn't want to name himself. He didn't want to claim that credit. If we look in the Gospel of John when he wrote, there's a few places in the Gospel where he had to name himself. Just in the story, in the situation, and instead of just saying you know, me or even John, he, he used the title, the disciple Jesus loved, right, to stay incognito. But as we look at the, the letters, um, you know, in, in 1 John, we see there's not a formal introduction. There's not a formal conclusion. It is a letter, but, but it's, it, it's different than the other two. In 2 and 3 John, he opens with his, his uh, even addressing who he is, and yet our modern translations say John the Elder. But if we look at the original language, he doesn't name himself still. He still goes by just the title, The Elder. And he, he went, again, wrote those anonymously. Now, the only one he named himself in was in Revelation. Okay? And he does specifically say that who he is and why he's writing at the beginning part of Revelation. But again, we see that kind of the aspect of him and, and where he, he likes to present and keep the focus on Jesus and Jesus himself, not on, on him as the writer. First John is unique out of all of it because um, it's not really a letter, but it, it is a letter. It's written in that way, but it's not like a letter because it lacks an, a formal intro and conclusion like most of the New Testament letters have. Second and third John have those, and they're obviously letters. First John is a little different. It, it, he dives right in. It has a very abrupt beginning and a very abrupt end. And, and as we look at that, we jumped into it last week. Right? And saw the abrupt beginning. That we literally just jumped into the deep end with John. Now, with that also is the way that John writes. He writes with a circular reasoning. Right? That we see these topics like light and love and life. They, we, we come around to them a few different times as he, as he takes us through the letter. And, and he kind of jumps around. Where In Paul's letters, which we're more familiar with, he wrote the majority of the New Testament... He takes us straight to his point, and we kind of take this straight staircase right up to where he's leading us. But, but John writes um, in, in a more of a circular reasoning. Again, if, if Paul's letters are just a straight staircase, John takes us up a, a spiral staircase, right? And we go round and round and round up to eventually the destination. And yet he does take us to a clear destination, and, and that abrupt ending ends with this final verse, which is the theme verse of this series and this study for us. And it, it is uh, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 21, where he says, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Again, as we think about even just the point of our faith, right, it is a relationship with God. And, and as we saw even in our, our previous series in worship, that, that everything, that, that's what God cares about the most is our heart. Okay? He wants a relationship with you. And, and John gives us, again, this warning in this letter, the, the overarching theme of it is don't let anything get between your heart and your God. And we know there's all kinds of things that can do that. 
right? That they, they lead us astray, that they get us off path, that distract us from what life is really about. And, and he says, just don't let anything get between your heart and God himself. He said, last week we jumped right into what John brings out is the foundational life choice of confessing God about our sin, right? And letting God into our lives. And when we do that, that God is light. And we see this, this theme run all through scripture, but especially through John's writings about, about God being light. And light represents holiness and purity, right? And, and all that is right, right, with, with God. And yet darkness in, in scripture, not just in John's writing, darkness always represents sin and evil, right? And as we see this theme, John pulls this out of saying that, that God himself is light. And when we, when we accept him into our life and, and receive him as our savior, then that light comes into our life and into our heart. And that, that light is supposed to permeate everything in our, in, um, again, in, in our world, right? In, in our perspective, in our mind, and in our hearts. We saw he, is he, he calls out about hypocrisy and about claiming that we, that we don't have sin. And, and he says, don't make that choice to live a life of integrity. Making sure that our, world tru- that our words truly match our actions. And he tells us to get rid of any darkness in our lives so that we can truly live in the presence of God. And as we think about that, again, I want to just remind us of where we left off last week. We stopped with 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. And so I want to remind you of this, right? The conclusion of that first section says that those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Right? That Jesus is not just the foundation of our faith, but he is our example to follow. Right? That he is the, he's the destination of our journey. He's the goal of our life. is to be more like Christ tomorrow than I am today, right? And that's what our faith journey is about, about being transformed by God's spirit and moving forward in that journey closer to Jesus every single day. And he says, that, again, if you say that you live in God, then that should be your goal, right? And that you are going to make progress in that journey every single day. And again, I want to bring this up because we have to keep this idea in mind as we move into the next section of the letter, which we are going to read this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, Please open with me to 1 John chapter 2. We are going to pick up right after where we left off with verse 7. So if you're here with us in person and you don't have your own Bible, there are Bibles provided for you in the seats. You're welcome to grab that and follow along there. You'll notice the page numbers included on the outline of where you can find this passage in those Bibles. If you're with us online, you can grab your Bible and follow along as well. Like I said, we are going to read this the next section of chapter 2, starting at verse 7, where it says, Uh, Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before. And yet, it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims I'm living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. I'm writing to you who are God's children because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I'm writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts, and you have won your battle with the evil one. Yeah, I encourage you to just leave your Bible open. We're going to come back to it a couple different times here this morning. But as we look at this next section of what John presents us, right, he builds on top of of this this opening concept that, again, if you say you live in God, you should live as Jesus did. And and then he jumps in here in verse 7 to these first uh, 7 through 11 as he talks about this old and new commandment. 
Right? He's like, it, it's an old one. It, it's been there from the beginning. Nothing has changed in that, but it is also new. And, and he says that Jesus has brought this to light. And as he talks about this, is again, he's like, now you, have, you bring this light into your life, and that light brings all kinds of different things with it. And, and as he points out, as he talks about this old commandment that's also new, and, and through this, he makes an assumption right, that the audience that's reading this knows what that commandment is. Again, John is alluding back to, to not just this, the life of Jesus and the teaching of Jesus, but, but even beyond that, even into the Old Testament and the, the, the old law and, and all of that. He's, he's making this assumption that we know what that is. Right? And, and if we know that, then we get the, the underlying concept that he's presenting here, is that when the true light of God comes into your life, it brings with it the love of God. Again, the love of God is something that, uh, that it's not just something that Jesus does. It's not emotion. It's who Jesus is. It is who God is. It is a part of his character. Right. right? God is not just loving. He is love. He's the definition of what love is. And so when his light comes into our life, right, and starts to distinguish the darkness, it, he does it through love. And again, okay, how do we get there? Well, we get there because of, again, this, this old and new commandment that he assumes that we know. Okay, now, we looked at this and because as we look back into the Gospels and look at the life of Jesus, okay, there were several different times where the religious leaders and the Pharisees and those that were living this Old Testament law and living in the First Covenant, they, they, they tested Jesus. They, they tried to stump him with different questions. They, one of the questions we see they bring to Jesus to try and catch him you know, uh, um, in a trap, right? to try and corner him, was they, they were asked him this question about what's the most important commandment of the law. Okay, now, Jesus' answer to this is actually a very famous one. It's, it's, it's known as the greatest commandments. It's found in Matthew 22. Okay, Matthew 22, verses 36 through 40. Or it says, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is equally important to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Okay, now as we read these Notice, they're trying to stump Jesus. They're trying to say, hey, sum up all of the Old Testament law. Try to sum it up. What's the most important one? And what's Jesus' answer? Jesus' answer is, it's love. Right. right? It's all summarized in love, right? The first thing is that God loves you more than we can ever imagine, so the first thing is to love him back. Right? It's, it's to, to love him back, right? And, and, and this love God with everything you have. And he's like, and the second one is equally important. And that's not not just to love God, but love everything that God loves, which is everybody else. <laughs> right? And, and he says that is the old commandment, right? Is, is love. In fact, as you look back in the, in the other Gospels, in fact, we see this story, a similar story in all the other Gospels. The, the awesome thing is in, in the Gospel of Luke, when they, they this kind of same story, is it comes to the, I think the conclusion of, of Luke's version is they say, no one dared to ask Jesus any more questions. Right? Because he sidestepped the trap, didn't he? Right? Nobody could even give a response to it. They all knew he was right. Right? And, and with that said, they knew what this old commandment was. Right? It has not changed. It's love. It's love God and it's love others. And so it's not just this old commandment, but John tells us it is also made new. Right? It's not just an old commandment, it's also a new one. And he, he, again, he tells us at the, the beginning part of verse 8, right, where he says that Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. Right, meaning that, that love was supposed to be what was fueling the whole Old Testament law. Right? Even the whole point of the first covenant and the law and, and the sacrifices, all those things was supposed to be fueled by the love of God. And that's where it started. And yet 
he's pointing out what Jesus continued to point out to the Pharisees and the religious leaders. It's why he picked so many fights with them, was because they started out at that place where love was fueling it all, and then they, they, they drifted from that. They added in all their own traditions and these, their own rules and, and all these kinds of things. And they took this, this loving relationship with God that we we're supposed to be at and they turned it into a religion by adding a whole bunch of boxes to check and hoops to jump through and rules to follow. And, and Jesus' point to all of them, why he was so upset with them all the time was he's like, you have drifted from what it was supposed to be about. And, and John reminds us that that was part of the mission of Jesus, was to get us back on track, yeah. right? To show us how much that, that first covenant had drifted off and it wasn't working anymore. That's why Jesus came as a Messiah to bring in the new covenant of grace, right? To, to get us back on track, to refocus us, right? In fact, we, as we look at the teachings of Jesus, that's what, that's what he did all the time. He took the Old Testament law that he with his life and his, and his death and his resurrection fulfilled and brought in this new covenant, right, at the place where he takes all those old things and he kind of flips them upside down and says, let's get refocused back in the right thing. Yeah, in fact, we see him do that with, in the Sermon on the Mount. He takes all these Old Testament laws and he's like, you've heard about this law, but guess what? You're missing the point. So now let's, he adds this other part to it. This is exactly what he does in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 and 45, where he addresses these commandments. Okay, he says, you've heard that, it, that the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And in that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. And he said, notice that Jesus starts out. He says, you, you've heard, you, you know that the law says, love your neighbor. And he's like, and yet you've added in this hate your enemy part. He's like, that's where you've drifted. And he's like, now I'm telling you that, that now we not only do you love your neighbor, right, those that love you, but now you go back to what the law was supposed to be about, loving everybody, especially if they hate you, right? Because the ways of Jesus, the way of God is different than the way of the world, right? And you're saying it is, it, it, the world has affected you know, even the religious landscape, and it's drifted to where it, it, you've missed the whole point. Because when light enters our life, when it enters our heart, it enters our mind, when the presence of God and the light that comes with that, it comes with that light, it penetrates our hearts and our minds, it exposes the darkness, and it, it gets, rid, get, gets rid of it, and it shows where we have drifted off of what God wants for us. Hey, and, and as we see that, then, as John establishes this old covenant, uh, that it's also been made new through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, then he gets to this, this incredibly foundationally powerful statement in the second part of verse 8, where he says, For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. Okay, now, as we see this, again, like I said, this is a, a very powerful statement, and, and this kind of shows us now how do we continue to live in the light, right? These are some very practical things for us to understand as for us to move forward in our faith journey. The first one is just, I could encourage you to underline, circle the phrase, the darkness is disappearing. Okay, because he tells us this, and to, to remind us that what God wants for us in our life is progress, not perfection. He wants progress. He wants you to move forward, move, move closer to your destination, which is Jesus, to be more like Jesus tomorrow than you are today. Okay, now, again, the blood of Jesus, when we pray and receive him as our Savior and ask him into our life we can, and confess those sins, we are forgiven, and we are made perfect because of the blood of Christ. Okay, and so, again, our past has been made perfect, but God says now as you move forward, there's still some dark corner. There's, there's still some things that are, that are looming in your life and in your habits and in your, in your perspectives that God needs to continue to mold out of you. Yeah. Right? And so you need, you need to just, just make progress. You just need to take the next step that God puts in front of you to be closer to Christ tomorrow than I am today. Okay, that I, I, my goal is to be perfect, like Jesus is perfect, but what God really wants is progress. Because it's one of the things that typically holds people back in their faith, 
right? It even holds them back from receiving Christ as Savior for the first time is this lie that the, that the world puts in our head, right? About like, you're not good enough. You're not perfect. God can't love you because you're not perfect. So that's a lie. That is a lie, right? And so because we think that we have to be perfect, then we just re- push God out completely. And God's saying, you don't have to be perfect because you can't be perfect on your own. That's why Jesus came. And that's why he lived and he died and he rose again. Right? And so now we are just here to say, God, I, I, as I surrender myself to you, I will make progress. Right? Now, again, that's my goal. That is the goal of our faith is to be holy like he's holy. Right? To, to move towards perfection the way that Jesus is. But I'm not already there. Right? And God says, that's okay. I'm with you. I, I'm walking with you to transform you, right? to, to move you closer to that. God wants progress, not perfection. And as we think about that in, in our lives, again, what, what progress towards letting that light enter our life, right? And again, dar- again, darkness is sin. All sin is selfish in nature. And so, again, what needs to be disappearing in the midst of this progress? He says the darkness is disappearing. What's disappearing is myself, right? That it's less of me and more of him, to quote John the Baptist. Right? That's the progress that God wants for us as followers of him. Right? The, the, we're in this transformation process of uh, dying to myself and letting God take the place where I used to be. Amen. Right? As the darkness disappears and more light comes in. Yeah. Right? Now, the, the, the next thing that he points out, the next really important phrase here in this verse is the phrase, the true light. Get underline, circle that phrase, okay, the true light. Because the true light is God. Okay, he, again, he is the light, right? He is the true light. Now, this naturally, though, implies that there, is, there are false lights. Right, as John points out, make sure that the light in your life is actually God. Okay, in fact, Scripture even tells us that even... I mean, the devil himself masquerades as an angel of light. Don't be tricked. Don't drift. Right? Don't let anybody tell you something about Jesus that Jesus didn't claim about himself. They, they, they make sure that it is the true light, that it is actually God that you are following. Again, Jesus talks about, right, that as his sheep will only follow his voice. Right? Don't follow other voices. Don't follow false voices. Don't follow what the world tells you is, is good. And, and, right? Only follow God, the true light. We must make sure that it is God that we are worshiping. Because we all worship something. Right? And we about have to make sure, take, take careful account that it is truly God. Not another person, not an idea, not, not anything of the world, right? That it is God, that he is the true light. And he says, again, the, the last phrase, right, of, of God. He says, the, the darkness is appearing, and the true light is already shining. Okay, underline, circle that phrase, already shining. Okay, he's reminding us that Jesus has already claimed the victory. Right, that he's already won. He has conquered sin and death through his life, his death, and his resurrection. That has already been done. And so he's telling us, uh, again, that, that Jesus himself, reminding us that he didn't come to be served by the world. He came to serve the world, right? To die in our place, to pay the price for sin and death. And he has already conquered it. Because that light is already shining. It is finished. That's exactly what Jesus said, right? And we have to be reminded of that, right? That that, that victory is already there. Okay? And all we have to do is claim that victory right? by opening our life and our heart to him and saying, God, my way is going down the wrong path, right? And when I'm living for myself, instead I will ask, receive you in my life, get that, that love, that grace, that forgiveness as I confess my sin and invite Christ into my life for the first time and then I start on that new journey. Right, and once I join that journey of faith, then I move forward with everything that I can. And I live in the victory that was won through Christ. Yeah. Hey, now, again, 
Jesus tells us, right, that we will live in that victory. It doesn't mean that we won't have struggles, that we won't have, have, have trials, right, or hard times and hard seasons. In fact, Jesus told us exactly the opposite of that in John 16, 33. He says, I have told you all this so you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome the world. Right? We will still have hard things. We will face struggles. We still have, have things we don't understand right? as, as we live in this dark world. But notice he doesn't say that we won't have those, but he just says, but you can still find peace even in the midst of that. Why is that true? Because God promises to walk with us through those dark valleys. Right? He says, you will have trials, but you can take heart because not, I will be with you in the midst of those trials, and I have already won, right? I've already come, overcome that, that darkness. As you think about the famous Psalm 23, right, with, and the line that says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, right, I will fear no evil because of why? Because you are with me. Right? And God's presence as we walk through that valley brings us a peace that we can't explain any other way. Will we have trials? Absolutely. Will we still struggle from time to time? Right? Do we still you know, struggle because we live in a dark world? Of course. Right? But God is with us. He's already claimed the victory. And as, as he, he gives us again this, this powerful statement right, of, of this the ways that we are to live in God, right, and, and to continue to fight and move forward and grow. We have this interesting section and break in the letter, okay, in verses 12 through 14. Okay, and this is where we feel like that we're kind of going around the circle in the staircase a little bit. We're like, John, what are you doing with us? Okay, and, and 12 and 14 is this place where he starts out and saying that who he's writing to, right? He says, I'm writing to, to you as, as, ch- as children of God. Right? And then he says, and I'm writing to the mature believers, and I'm writing to the, to the, to the immature, the new believers. And then, he, and then, he, then he, we go around the circle one more time, right? As he reads, he's like, I'm talking to, to the children of God, and to the mature people, and to the, to the immature people. Right? And, and, and as we do this, we see we're like, this, this kind of breaks the flow of the letter. Be, but yet, so John, what are you doing with these verses? Again, first off, we have to remember, again, who does he write to? Who does he address in these verses. He addresses every single believer. Right? He starts out with the, the identity we have when we receive Christ our Savior. We are God's child. He says, I'm writing to, to those that are God's children. Okay, that is our identity in Christ. Okay, notice all of the big cultural issues that are going on in our world today. They all attack your identity. Right? To, to drift us off from that idea and that focus of that, that I am God's child. Okay, that is your identity. And then he says, then again, to the mature ones, to, to, to the new ones, right? All of these things. And, and he, he just reiterates all of this to get us to understand and this little pep talk in the middle of the letter that every follower of Jesus can live in victory every day as we journey forward. He's reminding us, no matter where you're at, no matter, everybody's journey is different, right? We all might grow at a different pace. We have different experiences. We bring different things into the past, right? With, that, that, that Jesus has paid for. And, and as we start with all of that, he's saying, no matter where you are in Christ, if you are with Christ, if you are his child, then you live in victory every day. Right? And you continue to grow forward. And he gives us this kind of little pep talk to every believer, okay? because to remind us of our true identity as God's child and to say you live in victory every day because he's about to, lo- to throw another truth bomb in our lap in the next part of chapter 2. Okay, he's reiterating to us, don't, don't fear, don't, don't know this, right? Just gain this confidence that comes in living in victory with Christ. And then he drops the next big truth bomb in verses 15 through 17. Hey, now these verses starts, the, the, this final section, the rest of chapter 2, is all focused on eschatology, on, on the end times. Hey, this is, now let's look in verses 15 through 17. He says, do not love this world, nor, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, 
a craving for everything we see, a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. You know, as we read this, right, he, he again presents this choice that's in the front of us, right? To the, the fork in the road, right? It's like you're either going to live for the world or you're living for God. Okay? And, and the truth bomb is that this world is fading away. And so if you're living for anything other than God, right, you are going to lose it. And it's time to make a choice. Right? What is your life about? Are you living for God or are you living for yourself? And now again, the way we ask that question right, around Faith Journey Church is what's the destination of your journey? What is your life focused on? What, is, what are you living for? Is it Jesus Christ? That's our core value number one as a church, that the destination of our journey is Jesus. Okay, that's what my life is about. Is it God? Because if it's not God, it's, it's something else. And if it's something else, it's going to fade away. Okay, that this world is fading away. Okay, why is that true? He's saying if it's anything other God, you will lose it. Okay, and, and he presents this choice to us in these verses. Right, be, because, because of what he, he drops on us in verse 18. Okay, the very next verse, in verse 18, he says, Dear children, the last hour is here. That's why we're going to lose it. If it's not God, we're going to lose it because the last hour is here. And, and he's, he's, he's addressing exactly what you think he's addressing. He's saying that Christ is coming again and this world as we know it is going away. Either into eternal punishment or, or eternal presence of God in heaven. He's saying that the last hour is here. Again, when he wrote that, I, and I believe that John and his, the, the first century church and the audience he wrote this to, they all believed with everything they had that the second coming of Christ was going to happen in their lifetime. They, and, and he was telling them, he's like, there's, there's an urgency to the gospel. Okay, that Christ is coming back again. Okay, and, and the last hour is here. Now, I would say every generation of the church since the apostles and John have thought the same thing. Everybody looks at the world and says the world cannot possibly get any worse. Right? It cannot get any darker. Right? And so God has to be coming back. And guess what? We're still here. Right? And yet this is still true. Okay? The last hour is here. Because whether it is the second coming of Christ that, that even that John addresses right, in, in Revelation specifically, right? Or wh whether that, that's the last hour or whether it's just our last hour on earth. It's here. There's an urgency. Right? Tomorrow is not promised. Right? And, and again, whether Christ returns in our lifetime or he doesn't, the, the same choice is still in front of us, and the same urgency is still there. You're either living for God and you'll be with him for eternity, or you're not. The last hour is here. Right? And he presents, again, just this, this cold, hard truth that we have to hold everything of this world with open hands because Jesus could come at any moment. And even if Jesus doesn't return in our lifetime, our last hour could come at any moment. Right? And God gave us the free will to make a choice. And he's telling them and he's telling all of us, it is time to make that choice. Will your life be about God? Or will it be about yourself and the things of the world? And once you make the choice to follow God, and you pray and ask forgiveness and invite Christ into your life and bring that light into your life, you join the journey of faith. And once I make that choice, then it, it is, I take that same urgency and, and I, I take up the mantle to be God's ambassador and to share that love and that light with everybody else that needs to make that choice. Because the world's, the last hour's here for them too. Right? And that's why, again, we pray for those people on those 360 cars. We invite them to church. We, sh we talk to them about who God is and, and make sure that they, that they know what we also know because they need Jesus too. Again, there's an urgency to this text and there's an urgency to the gospel itself. 
that it is time to make a choice. Because God loves you more than you can imagine, and he wants a relationship with you today. The last hour's here. And then he dives deeper into this point in this last section in verses 18 through 29. Again, picking up 1 John 2, picking up at verse 18. He says, Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. And when they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that. For the Holy One has given you this, his spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I am writing to you not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy the eternal life he promised us. I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you. So you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know. And what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he has taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. Now, as we look at this section and, and these verses, again, he, like I said, this is all eschatological. This is talking about the end. Right? And, and again, he starts off with a statement, right, that, that the end is here. And then through these verses, he gives us some tips, right, as followers of Jesus, how to live a godly life in the last hour. Okay, because the last hour is here. Okay, and, and with that said, right, what do we have to do? How do we live, again, this godly life? Okay, he starts out, the first thing he points out is in verses 18 through 23, as he gives us this concept of antichrist. Okay, now, that's the first thing that he points out in these verses, is that in the last hour, there will be many antichrists. Okay, and notice where he starts out. He starts off to saying, you've been looking for the antichrist. Okay, now, this is the same antichrist right, that he addresses in Revelation 13. Again, this, the foundation that he sets here in 1 John, again, he carries into his other writing in Revelation. And as we look at this, we realize, right, that he tells them the same thing that he's already pointed out earlier. He says, don't get so focused on the Antichrist that you, that you drift, right, that you get distracted, okay? Because the real idea and concept is that you are either living for Christ, you are living in the light, or you're not. You are either for Christ or you are anti-Christ. And he says there are all kinds of things that are anti-Christ in this world. And so, in fact, he even calls out, he says some of them are even in the ranks of the church. But some of them have left. Right? Because again, when the light truly shines, if they're darkness, they have to leave. Right? And he tells us this as he addresses this. He says, don't get distracted. Don't let anything pull you off. Again, he's just reiterating, again, a concept that Jesus himself taught us in the gospel. Right? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus' words, he says, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. I mean, it seems pretty clear, doesn't it? You are either for Christ, working with him, or you are against him. You are anti-Christ. Right? And John is reminding us to stay focused on what you know. Stay focused on what is true, on that is not lies, right? And that is Jesus. 
And don't let any of these antichrists or even any, don't get distracted with all this end time stuff. Just stay focused on what you know is true. Stay, and stay focused on, on what God has told you to do, which is the next thing he tells us in verses 24 and 25. That in the last hour, as God's children, we must remain faithful. Stay on the right path. Don't get distracted. Don't veer off. Don't even worry about all these different things that are floating around here about the Antichrist or whatever else it is. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Stay on that path. Don't drift. In fact, he, if you might have noticed, he says remain faithful over and over and over again in those few verses. And, and in fact, in verses 24 and 25, we literally see the definition of our faith, of what, what our, our faith is about. He says, so you must remain faithful to what you've been taught from the beginning. For if you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. And in this fellowship, we enjoy eternal life. Again, fellowship with God, right? A relationship with God. That's what it's all about. Right? That's what he says. And if you remain faithful, just stay focused on that. Right? And, and if, if you end that, if, if your relationship with Jesus, which means you also have this relationship with God himself. Right? And, and he says, and guess what? The big fringe benefit of that relationship is life eternally with him in heaven. But getting to heaven is not the goal of our faith. Right? It's not the goal of our faith. The goal of our faith is to be made holy like he is holy. To be in relationship with him is the process of that. That is the goal of our faith. And, and it's, it's about a relationship, not about a religion. And as we live in that relationship, the really good friend's benefit, as he reminds of that, is heaven. Right? Is God's unhindered relationship and presence for all of eternity. And, but again... He tells us, in the last hour, just remain faithful. Stay focused. Don't drift. Don't get distracted. Focus on your relationship with God. The next thing he tells us in verses 26 and 27 is that in the last hour, we must rely on the Holy Spirit. Again, he reminds us that as a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit in you. And the Holy Spirit will, will lead you, will guide you, will open your eyes, will open your heart, will convict you, will, will show you your next step. He says, just rely on the Holy Spirit. Again, remind us in these verses, there are lots of things that will lead you astray, that will try to get you to drift, to get caught in a trap, but just rely on what the Holy Spirit teaches you. And go back to that known truth. Again, it is God that teaches you. It is God that saves you. And, and again, part of that warning, right, is that, that don't lose sight of that fact. Hey, don't put your faith in a person. Don't put your faith in a church. Don't put it in a religion. Put it only in God. Hey, it is the Holy Spirit that teaches you. It is the Holy Spirit that saves you. Again, even my job as your pastor is not, is not to teach you, not to save you. It's to point you to the source of truth. And let the Holy Spirit do his job. Exactly. Hey, don't put your faith in me. Put your faith in God and only in God. Amen. Don't put your faith in any other religious leader right, or any other pastor. And, and, and any teaching that takes the focus off of God himself, run from that teaching. Focus on the Holy Spirit. In the last hour, you must be faithful and rely on the Holy Spirit to teach you. The Holy Spirit is the one that saves you. The Holy Spirit is the one that teaches you. And the last thing he tells us in verses 28 and 29, he says, in the last hour, we to live with courage instead of fear and shame. Live in courage, not in fear and shame. And I'll tell you, when you if you even talk about, and it's, been, it's, it's kind of risen up in our culture recently, right, about the end of the world and, and all this sort of stuff. And, like, again, if you go on, go down that, that, that YouTube rabbit hole, right, of listening to people talk about the end times and about all this stuff, is it's shrouded in fear. And yet, we are reminded here by John, right, to, that we are not to live in fear and shame as a child of God. We are to live with courage because Jesus has already won the victory, Right? The battle has been won. And, and if we are walking with Jesus every day, we have nothing to fear, 
Even about the end times. The end times, Jesus' second coming, is a day of glory and praise and victory for us. Because the battle has already been won. You don't have to be afraid, right? In fact, that's exactly right. We look at light brings in love. And guess what love does? It expels all fear. And so we are being encouraged. You live in courage, right? Live with courage. Live with confidence of knowing, right, that I am not being drifted. I'm not focused on anything else. And as long as I do that, I will remain faithful. And I will just use every moment of every day. If there's breath in my lungs, I'm still moving forward closer to Christ. And I will not drift from that. Regardless of what's happening in our world, regardless of what's in the headlines, right, any of that, that I am going to be faithful, rely on the Holy Spirit, and I will live in victory with courage to face whatever is in front of me. You know, I don't know where you're at in your journey today, but my hope is that you will find the light and love of Jesus, even for the first time, the, the last hours here. Make that choice. If you've never made that choice, you can make that choice today. And if you have, then make the choice to stay faithful and keep moving and, and be more like Christ tomorrow than you are today. And take the step forward that God's telling you to take. And our final thought is, comes from 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, where it really sums up this whole section. It says that this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Right? Is your life living to please God, to love him back, because he already loves you more than you can imagine? Like I said, I don't know where you're at in your faith journey today. I hope you will move forward. Take that step, what the Holy Spirit's putting in front of you. Lord God, we praise you today that this earth is filled with your glory. God, that even amidst all the darkness and all the sin and all the evil, God, that your light can break through. God, that your presence is with us. Lord, we pray that that light, Lord, would break into our hearts and our lives. God, that you would expel the darkness. And Lord, we pray that not only do we grow in our own faith, Lord, as, as we take it seriously, we, we commit to growing every day to get that light stronger and stronger, but Lord, that that light would not stay in us, but it would flow through us into this dark world. Lord, that as we live our faith, that we would... It would bring others to find your light too. It's so desperately needed. And Lord, we are thankful that you love us. God, that you bring us a courage and a victory that we can live in every day as your child. And Lord, as we go this week, Lord, help us to live our faith, to shine your light, Lord, in every day, in every conversation, in every interaction, in, in every relationship. God, that we would live our faith, and that we would shine your light into this world and help others to find you as well. God, we praise you that this, this world is filled with your glory. We claim that truth today. Guide us as we go and we live that truth every day this week. We love you. We praise you. It's in the precious name of Jesus we